So, what are the unique challenges that you have faced when it has come to selling whatever marketing initiatives you had to? At the heart of it, marketing is about communicating what problem you are solving. Hi, Roshan. Welcome to Startup Stories India, a initiative, a marketing initiative started by Legal Pay, where we interact with. Uh, people as stakeholders at various companies who have you know various indus- uh, industries uh, experience primarily so let me just give you an introduction about you so we have uh, mr roshan with vimo with us and vimo is uh, one of the world's most trusted sales engagement platform tailored primarily for financial institution and i believe that you work on a mobile first approach and you efficiently are addressing more than 18 industry specific uses for all these uh, sectors So now I just want to understand what basically Vimo does. So maybe you can just uh, you know start by telling us what Vimo as a company f- functions on. Hey, thanks so much for the invite, Dhruv. Uh, it's a real pleasure being with you guys. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the intro as well. Uh, so I've been with Startups for the last fifteen years. I head marketing now at uh, Vimo. I also run a podcast called The Startup Operator, where we talk to founders, operators, and investors in the Indian startup ecosystem. We've published four uh, hundred plus episodes over the last three years. Uh, it's been a lot of fun trying to curate uh, the wisdom in the ecosystem. Uh, when I started off fifteen years back, there wasn't much precedence. There wasn't much uh, insights that uh, you know founders could leverage. Uh, so my objective with this podcast was to really uh, curate all of these. Uh, uh little nuggets of wisdom that's in people's heads uh that is acutely dependent on execution uh right so so that's what i've been trying to do with the podcast um right. and uh, so vimo is a sales engagement platform so think of it as an app that your relationship manager or insurance agent uses uh, to plan schedule be more productive in their day um uh, we figure out what the what what is working for the best folks in the organization and kind of uh, drive these uh, good behaviors downstream uh, through nudges and interventions so that is what we do uh, we're about 10 years old uh, across asia us and japan uh, about 60 plus uh, customers using us in these geographies uh, 350000 uh, plus users and uh, yeah that's uh, where we are right now all right great i mean so primarily you are catering to the marketing industry so i mean from a business perspective especially in the b2b sector what are the changes which you do anticipate you know in the dynamics over the next decade uh, considering the present state of the marketing industry uh see the more things change the more they tend to remain the same uh, right so right. the fundamentals are uh, you know um are ever constant i would say right i mean you still have to address a specific solution for your uh, prospect and uh, uh, really i mean when we talk about enterprise um, you know the the game is very different right, right. Uh, it's it's not a very straightforward um, solution fit as such you really have to understand the organization's objective you have to understand the team's objectives and then finally uh, map it down to individual folks who may be influencers or champions in that specific uh, uh, buying committee right uh, so it is a, nice. uh, a slightly more complex process as against a b2c process right um, the decision making is a lot more complex i would say um, and with respect to b2b i think you know there's been a whole transition from suits to sneakers i would say right, right? i mean uh, right. Uh, if you look at it 15 20 25 years back it was uh, it was primarily the communication was in the form of these brochures and bullet points uh, right cheaper faster better um, right. or this much of uh, serving uh, savings and this much of uh, uh, you know top line revenue impact and so on and so forth while we do talk about some of those things right now uh, i think there's a lot more emphasis on storytelling right uh, painting right. that vision uh, because if you look at some of these saas software right i mean slack dropbox uh mm-hmm. snowflake mongodb etc i mean uh you know these these were not just creating whole new categories i would say they were inventing a new way to work right uh and when you're doing something like that i think it's important to paint a vision uh and storytelling becomes super important um right so i would say the single biggest change over the last 15 20 years that i have seen is that there has been a greater emphasis on storytelling in b2b so it's not simply cheaper faster better you have to paint that picture for your prospect now considering we were talking about how the future of the 
marketing industry would pan out. So now let's just try and focus on some of the challenges which you have personally faced as being an experienced personnel in the marketing and the SaaS sectors, and you have partnered with a lot of major companies around the world. So what are the unique challenges that you have faced when it has come to selling whatever marketing initiatives you had to? to them and as per your experience in dealing with these challenges how do you determine which is the most effective strategy or the value proposition to convince uh, the other person that this is you know the best way forward for you see the most effective strategy is a strategy that works right uh, so it could uh, differ from uh, my context to yours uh, mm-hmm. but i'll address it, I'll, I'll address this in the in a in a sort of a template that makes sense for a broad set of people right um, right at the heart of it marketing is about communicating what problem you're solving now the first right. uh, step in that is to identify what problem you're solving for whom uh, right so so that is something that you know people often skip ahead and get down to you know features and uh, you know product attributes and value propositions and so on and so forth right um, so if you think of it as a hero's arc right, um, right. your hero is leading uh, you know, a normal life, something happens in his or her life and uh, their life is transformed. It's not the same anymore, uh, right? I mean, can you sort of paint that vision with, uh, you know, whatever it is you're selling, right? Um, right. In in my case, uh, where I work, I mean, it is large enterprise SaaS, right? So which is right. that our average contract value is closer to half a million dollars. Um, mm-hmm. You know, our buying committee could be, somewhere between six to eight people. Um, and, uh, you know, the sales cycle itself could take somewhere between six to eight months uh, mm-hmm. and so on, right? So so it's a very long, complex sales cycle. So you have to, uh, you like they say, right? I mean, it takes, a, it, it takes a village to sort of hunt that deal, right? I mean, it, it's not going to close in uh, one meeting, one call, one demo and so on, right? I mean, I wish it did, but it won't, mm-hmm. right? Um, so you have to kind of look at this as a six month project and strategize, you know, how you can meaningfully move the deal forward, right? So every right. meeting has to move that deal uh, closer to, um, you know, uh, revenue basically for you, right? So, um, so that is really important. And there again, addressing the needs and priorities of these various stakeholders uh, becomes super impor- important because, right. you know, your uh, uh, the the head of business might be looking at top line as the be all end all, right? I mean, they want to meet their mm-hmm. quotas and you know maybe uh, buy that second car or buy another house. Uh, right. Whereas you know if you look at your CTO or a CIO, uh, mm-hmm. they they're worried about what risks a new system may bring on, right? Uh, so so they're worried about today, um, and so you have to sort of balance both of these priorities uh, as right. well, right? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm simplifying it for sake of mm-hmm. argument here, but you know, yeah. there are multiple sort of priorities that you mm-hmm. have to kind of balance. Uh, the thing that works really well in this case is, like I said, work as a team. Don't draw hard boundaries between marketing or sales or product and so on. Um, really pick different folks in these teams who can sort of uh, be part of the deal, right? Um, typically, you know, when we have our deal announcements on Slack and so on, um, you'll notice that there's literally, you know, 10 or 15 people who are tagged on the deal, right? right, uh, right. So it really takes a combined effort to kind of win such a deal. So uh, yeah, I would say the challenges are long complex sales cycles and the way to mm-hmm. mitigate them is to work as a team, uh, understand priorities and kind of communicate uh, uh, an effective solution for that right now since your answer was you know primarily focused around your uh, sales model and how you go about it so i mean for our viewers and listeners perspective could you i mean moving on to the competitive side uh, could you also provide insight as to how vino approaches client and also you you know how does it make their sales engagement space look so different from the other companies and how is primarily vino providing you know, or uh, basically uh, ensuring a sustainable, uh, sustainable differentiation compared to others in the long run. See, the differentiation uh, kind of emerges, right? I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, when you go into a market, let's say, I mean, six, seven years back, I mean, obviously, we needed a hook into the market, right? The hook for us was that, look, I mean, your legacy CRM systems are built for managers and leaders. Uh, they're right. basically database and reports. Uh, sadly, nobody is really using these systems, right? 
uh, right. the person on the ground doesn't really care about inputting data onto these systems they don't get anything back for them right mm -hmm. uh, that that could be useful it's a distraction from the real work uh, and i and i say this in all seriousness right it's a distraction from the real work that they have to do right, right. Um, but what we said was look we'll build for the user right mm -hmm. and we'll focus on that person mm -hmm. and uh, this data will then be automatically useful for managers and leaders because it's a bottom up data right so right. we pioneered a, a bottom up approach for crm and sales engagement as such uh, right um if you look at our value proposition over the years while philosophically that's what has remained constant we've also verticalized a fair bit right so today mm -hmm. when we uh, solve for an insurance agent or a distributor for instance mm -hmm. right we solve for all of their needs end to end right so mm -hmm. we either build integrate or acquire to solve that uh, need for them so today we are a system of work i should say for uh, the relationship manager or the agent we are the one app uh, that they need uh, in order for for them to sort of uh, meet and beat their uh, quotas and incentives right um right. and from a manager perspective uh, because i have these uh, uh, because i have data from the ground up right mm -hmm. i am now able to be more effective right i mean i'm sure dhruv that you know mm -hmm. you might uh, have seen this in your team as well when your team was maybe a couple of people two or three or four people it's right. easier for you to just like you know intervene and say hey do this or do that or you shouldn't be doing that or something else right right um, right right but then think of a, a scenario where you know there are hundreds if not thousands of people on the ground going and mm -hmm. meeting our customers uh it can get you know way out of hand right so uh, so what vimo does is it acts as a personal assistant for the end user and mm -hmm. it also acts as a personal coach right so it enables right. your managers to be that much more better uh, mm -hmm. and make data based interventions uh, right so so that is our differentiation in the market the fact that we're intelligent the fact that we're verticalized uh, right and uh, uh, that we solve uh, for this specific industry uh, very efficiently right now since i mean all these crm and all these uh, technology that you use and since you know this is every technological advancement within a company is also for our you know stakeholders uh, confidence that you know this company is providing me easier access to databases or you know maybe what programs i'm running with them or marketing initiatives i'm running with them and uh, speaking of technology how important do you feel is ai uh, in the current scenario especially you know how vimo is operating and how other marketing industries are operating and how do you see this transition from the you know the man force to this technological side of it see ai is a, a means for an end right i mean it mm -hmm. is uh, it is what you will make of it uh, right nothing can substitute solving a business objection uh, objective right so right. in that sense i mean whether you're using you know basic uh, business logic to solve something or whether you're using something like artificial intelligence i mean it's it's just uh, mm -hmm. uh, figuring out an efficient means to an end uh, right in that sense right. now for us we had intelligence baked in at the core of our application right so we thought mm -hmm. of uh, these kind of things 6 uh, 7 years back even before it became fashionable uh, so right. for us predicting the next best action for every agent or relationship manager was the key right uh and uh, you know we've been running machine learning algorithms and so on and so forth for mm -hmm. uh for years now right so even before right. this whole generative ai and all of that became a thing uh certainly i would say generative ai has sort of catapulted our capabilities to another level uh, mm -hmm. i would say there are things that are possible with gen ai today that mm -hmm. wasn't maybe a year two years back uh but you know again the the problem statement is again the same thing right how mm -hmm. can i make this person's life more efficient uh, right. right how can i increase top line for this particular customer or how can i improve customer experience and so on right so mm -hmm. with that problem statement statement in mind we using ai to solve for some of these workflows and some of these uh, 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 analysis analysis and so on and mm -hmm. so forth so so that's basically what we're doing right so um, if i could give you a little bit of an example right um, yes please in, yes think of uh, uh think of a scenario where you know you go to a website and you put down your details uh, mm -hmm. for insurance right i mean you're interested in insurance now what right. happens the next hour right you're bombarded with a bunch of calls from folks 
uh selling you right. all kinds of things right? right but in in a lot of these cases they don't really know who dhruv is they don't know dhruv's yes. priorities yes. right uh, and similarly you know uh, forget about if they if they don't know dhruv then how can how can they pitch the right product to do dhruv right and how can they engage right. dhruv in the uh, in the right way so all of those things are broken right mm-hmm. um so we are using uh, you know intelligence to not just assign the right sales person for dhruv but also mm-hmm. equip them with enough contextual data and intelligence to have a meaningful conversation and really be a a consultant really be a trusted right. advisor for dhruv mm-hmm. right so so those are some of the ways that you know we've been using uh, ai so i mean basically ai i mean you are right that ai is primarily a means to an end and to an extent i mean human touch somewhere or the other is required to you know cross the finish line maybe to get it across maybe you can use your use the ai to your benefits and then but still and human input or guidance might be necessary to yeah so for anything complex right i mean mm-hmm. you can you can only automate so many things right i mean for right. anything sufficiently mm-hmm. complex for anything that uh requires a certain degree of trust uh for anything mm-hmm. that is a bit of a high touch interaction um yeah you will definitely need humans at the for the last mile right um right. you know we are talking about uh valuable products like financial products right i mean these require someone to actually counsel talk to people and so on because if i were to off hand ask you you know what is the best insurance policy for you you may not know right uh so so there is a whole uh, you know uh, needs analysis and so on and so forth that has to happen now you can automate some of this but mm-hmm. in my estimation i mean you know it, it uh, maybe for um maybe for the bottom end of products and services i mean it might get completely automated away and it's already happening mm-hmm. but uh, you know for for anything that is sufficiently complex you will still need the human touch right i mean uh, since i mean we are talking about ai only and with the evolution that ai has suddenly brought in all of our lives maybe to craft an email or just to simplify an email to make it more professional we are all using ai and now with primarily with regards to reaching out to clients or potential clients how do you uh, propose or plan to shape the data and privacy compliance is within vimo to address any potential concern from a client with regards to the use of ai so because uh, we've been working with large enterprises and large enterprises have uh, really stringent uh, you know measures on security privacy and so on uh, right we've been compliant for a whole long time right i mean so we have all of the international standards met uh, we have a chief uh, uh, security and compliance uh, uh, um, officer at uh, vimo itself right uh, and uh, so we we meet all of these standards anyway mm-hmm. um but with ai obviously right i mean there is a uh, 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 further scrutiny in terms of what data sets you will be using to make these intelligent uh, predictions and so on and so forth and that is kind of a work in progress right? Uh, right what we're trying to do is work with the industry benchmarks and make sure that you know we meet all of these uh, it helps that you know we're partnered with uh, microsoft um, and uh, you know they obviously they have their uh, uh the highest levels of security when it comes to you know mm-hmm. data and so on uh and uh, you know we're compliant uh, with all of those things so so that's how we look at it okay so like uh, so i mean speaking of innovations ai is one part of it and uh, similarly you might uh, do might be using some sales uh, enablement to, uh, enablement tools primarily i mean so what innovations are you currently employing from a marketing perspective and from sales enablement uh, enablement tool perspective and uh, how do how do you feel that these automation streamlined task and true marketing impact comes from these human insight and creativity uh see uh, i mean sometime back we did a bit of an audit and we figured out that you know we're mm-hmm. using maybe like 15 or 20 marketing tools uh, right and and that number was actually a little higher in fact mm-hmm. right and since then i mean we've been very very focused on trying to trim down the number of things that we use right uh mm-hmm. some of these are of genuine genuine value and i can say you know zoom info for instance lucia uh, outreach right. chorus all of these are genuinely valuable mm-hmm. uh but a lot of the others are great to kind of experiment and see if you know it's really adding value uh and then take a call right i mean if it if mm-hmm. it really makes a difference uh i i think we've gotten to a point uh, and now so i mean now i'm kind of seeing a correction but we mm-hmm. were at a point in 21 22 i think as an industry where 
there was just like a massive inflation of tools right i mean you had 20 right. tools for everything mm-hmm. uh, and it's good that you know well we're kind of correcting on that front right so mm-hmm. our technology stack is pretty lean for marketing uh, mm-hmm. hubspot, hubspot is our system of work uh, uh, and uh, we pretty much uh, make do with that for a lot of things right running campaigns right. Uh, and so on and so right. forth mm-hmm. um, everything else is basically point solutions layered on top of this right so mm-hmm. uh sales enablement specifically i mean we're using uh chorus um and outreach and between these two i mean we have uh, mm-hmm. enough going right now for us to sort of uh, uh do the best right uh so i mean uh, how important it is as per you and especially also from vimo perspective to strike a balance between these automation and human centric storytelling in its marketing strategies so like i said you know i mean as much as things change i mean they remain the same uh, mm-hmm. i would say uh, so you know i mean you can have ai and web3 and this and that uh, coming into the fold but ultimately you know marketing is about telling a compelling story and that is right. really what we focus on right a few ways that you know we have tried to inculcate that spirit in the team is to make sure that every person irrespective of whether they're a designer or uh, a growth person or a copy person can write decent copy and content right if they have right. to you should be able to articulate um uh, articulate a problem and solution right mm-hmm. that's the first thing second thing is irrespective of who you are again whether you're in growth or inside sales or design or whatever uh, you should talk to prospects and customers uh, and users often enough right now i mm-hmm. understand that you may not be able to have a conversation every day but you can certainly make it a priority uh, to have this conversation once a week or maybe a couple of weeks and so on right mm-hmm. you should definitely definitely talk to your um, uh, end users and customers so that you right. can revisit your hypothesis um, you know often mm-hmm. enough right i mean uh, gone are the days in you know when marketing was just a bunch of folks sitting in air conditioned rooms and mm-hmm. writing stuff that they thought that people would relate to right i mean it doesn't doesn't work like that anymore right. so so those are two things that we do uh, to make sure that everyone has um, good enough context uh, to be able to market right um, the tools itself uh, whether it's automation or intelligence i mean they are just like the cherry on top for us right right, uh, right. so yeah i mean uh, you know there are some tools that obviously you know uh, improve our capabilities tremendously right mm-hmm. uh, over the last um, couple of years two or three years we've seen tremendous uh, uh, value in uh, outreach for instance right in just setting up our cadences for inside sales and so on uh, so so that has been really helpful but still right i mean a lot of automation mm-hmm. i think it just you know it, it just helps you do dumb things faster if you ask me right <coughs> so you have to be very careful what you automate uh, and still look at it as a one to one you know mm-hmm. uh, and uh, not lose uh, sight of that human centric approach that you were talking about now since i mean you primarily you're catering uh more than you know uh, 350k people within vimo a uh, lot of sales person especially and now sales is kind of a, an industry or specifically a segment where you know a lot of critique and feedback actually helps so how do you collect and incorporate feedback at a scale to continually enhance the platform considering the vast amount of employees that you have uh, under vimo well i mean different teams look at it differently uh, right mm-hmm. uh, i can speak for marketing specifically uh, i mean i'm sure that the product team has uh, ways and means of sort of uh, doing user research and so on i wouldn't be able to go into the depths of that but for marketing mm-hmm. uh, you know a few different ways right so one is right. uh, we have a customer marketing function within marketing that uh, uh, make sure that you know we're engaging with all of our customers we have an engagement health tracker um that you know we work very closely with the customer success and account management right. teams uh to ensure you know uh is the product serving the need of the customer uh is there something else that we could be doing uh, are we mm-hmm. missing the ball on something and so on and so forth right so that we're very close to the customer as much as possible right, uh, right? so so typically what happens is sales or a uh, customer success tends to get in between the marketing and the customer teams uh what we have tried to ensure is to have a direct line with the customer uh, right. right and and of course i mean with support from our uh, uh, other teams as well whether it's sales or customer success uh so so what we do is via the customer marketing function i mean we are in touch with a lot of these customers box and so on and so forth mm-hmm. then we also do a bunch of these user testimonials right so which is right uh 
where we talk to uh, plenty of users in an organization, try to understand mm-hmm. how they're using the application, uh, what value they're gaining, so on and so forth, and try to make he- heroes and champions of them, right? So we try to promote these folks within the org uh, itself, mm-hmm. uh, right? And, and then we have uh, uh, knowledge sessions where we invite a domain expert uh, mm-hmm. or a user or a, or a Spock uh, to kind of talk about, you know, how they're using Wimo. Uh, how right. it could be beneficial and the team might have mm-hmm. a few questions to them and so on and so forth right so right. um and and of course the best place to meet all of these folks is uh, events right uh, um so mm-hmm. we organize uh, a fair number of events round tables um and, and so on um often enough that you know we catch up with these prospects to really understand you know uh, uh, what's happening in their lives because i think that is important having context mm-hmm. of their lives Right. So right, not just looking right. at the way they use their app, right? Because that is one part of their life, right? You need mm-hmm. to really have a holistic picture of someone uh, if you're going to solve for them, right? And and that's what we try right. to do. Right. Uh, so now primarily, uh, like in the beginning, I mentioned that, you know, Vimo has expanded and is a world-renowned uh, company. So with your international expansion, how has the marketing, market, marketing strategy for Vimo evolved? And what aspects of Vimo's future roadmap is uh, the most exciting to you? That's a great question. So we operate in Asia, US and Japan. And the way each of these geographies behave is extremely different. Mm -hmm. The way our customers use our product is different. Uh, The people that we interact with are different in their needs and priorities. uh, And the way the industry is structured itself. So it's Mm -hmm. very important for us to localize sufficiently in order for us to understand that uh, last mile, right? So mm-hmm. what we've tried to do is centralize some of these functions. Uh, right. It could be like SEO uh, and so on, right? And localize some of the functions that had to be closer to the ground, whether it is mm-hmm. the inside sales function or whether it is right. field marketing and so on, mm-hmm. right? So between these two, we get a fair handle in terms of what the customer is thinking and feeling in each right. of these different geographies, right? Um mm-hmm. Also, it helps a great deal to align with the sales uh, and leadership teams, you know, Um, because, see, I am old fashioned in the sense that, Mm -hmm. you know, all of marketing exists to make a sale, right? Um, Right. So, so which means that you have to align with your sales and marketing leadership, right? Um, uh, So, so, so that is really important for us. Uh, And because we work so much on the alignment, uh, literally everything is, you know, flows downstream from revenue, right? I mean, so if you have a revenue target of 10 or 15 million in a particular geography, then you figure what pipeline is required and then you figure mm-hmm. what campaigns are required and so on and so forth, right? So so in that way, we are very closely aligned with uh, those teams on the ground and that helps us uh, serve our prospects uh, and customers better. Okay, I mean, that's great. Uh, now, since you're catering to a lot of international countries and states uh, primarily, uh, uh, could you share an example of a time where a campaign, you know, was not up to the mark or missed the mark and how efficiently uh, did you recover? So primarily, how good, you know, is damage control at Vimo? Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, I hope my team is not listening, but uh, yeah, I mean, we're experts at uh, damage control, I should say, right? And that's right. good and... You know, God has been kind that way, I should say. Uh, you know, uh, even though we've done, I don't know how many, 200, 300 events over the last six, seven years, sometimes right. when you're organizing an event, mm-hmm. it does come down to the last few hours before an event, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can see our team, myself included, hustling on call, trying to get people there and so on, right? So right. Uh, that is something that, that always happens. And you can talk mm-hmm. to other marketing leaders and they'll tell you the same, right? That Uh, With respect to events, it is always the last few hours, the few days that make the difference, irrespective of how much planning goes into it, right? Now, if my team Mm -hmm. is listening, please don't uh, uh, take that seriously, right? And and continue to plan and strategize, right? But uh, uh, so so there are a lot of cases where, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we have a venue, uh, our leadership is uh, sort of uh, uh, committed to visit the place and so on and then you know we don't have mm-hmm. enough guests right so mm-hmm. um so there's it, it involves a lot of like persuasion a lot of calling uh getting on the phone so on and so forth building incentive structures and so on to get right. people to actually show up right and uh, mm-hmm. yeah it's happened a couple of times and uh where it's it's just been like you know 
very very close and mm-hmm. you know uh, i i kind of age a couple of years every time something like this happens i should say mm-hmm. right so um yeah there are things like that um otherwise you know uh, in the digital space i mean mm-hmm. it's a lot more easier to get feedback right you run a campaign you go with the mm-hmm. hypothesis you figure out why it's not getting as many hits or if people are sort of landing on your page why they're not converting right. it's right. easy to sort of ask mm-hmm. those questions and like analyze and triangulate what the right answer is mm-hmm. um so yeah i'm sure that you know we've made mistakes plenty of times uh and it's just about failing forward right i mean you'd rather have those campaigns out uh and learn from those mistakes than try to like come up with the best uh, campaign possible without having uh, mm-hmm. launched any of them right which is also a, a problem that i notice uh, with a lot of marketing teams right that there's mm-hmm. this whole analysis paralysis that happens uh um, there are no perfect answers it's all a work in progress it's something that you learn um mid flight i should say right mm-hmm. so yeah so now roshan i'm basically going to give you a chance to uh be an original uh, person to quote something with regards to how important mistakes are when it comes to uh real life learning be it you know pan industry or pan sector or even in life for example so how important do you feel are mistakes especially in the learning phase of your life see the only way to kind of learn is to execute and when you execute mm-hmm. uh, on something sufficiently hard you're bound to stumble and fail uh, right. right uh it's not that you aspire to fail but i mean it, it you just it just happens right uh and there are two ways of kind of looking at this you can kind of think of all of these as you know oh my god you know mm-hmm. career ending stuff or you might kind of look at this as uh, ways to get smarter wiser uh, i would only say don't do the same mistake uh, twice uh, right or if you somehow do it twice don't do it another time right uh, because mistakes can be very very costly um, you know if you're doing one of these uh, large events and it's going to cost you 100000 there's only there's only so many dollars in the bank that you know you can spend uh, that kind of money right so right. Uh, you have to be careful you have to be mindful make mm-hmm. your decisions in a deliberate way right don't do mm-hmm. something because someone asked you f- to do it that way or because this is how mm-hmm. it is done uh right. look at things with first principles when you're able to reason with first principles then you have a rationale for why you're doing something right um and, and that really helps so that absolutely helps i mm-hmm. know this is not like a pithy concise quote as such but mm-hmm. yeah I, i would say i mean no, that's that's pretty good <laughs> no that's pretty good i mean from our conversation so far i could uh, understand i mean from your perspective how important innovation and growth is to you be it by mo or in your personal life you are quite passionate about innovation and growth so uh, keeping the future of marketing and technology in mind uh, how do you see yourself contributing to by mo and also beyond in years to come See the great thing about Vimo is that every couple of quarters or so I get to reset what my responsibilities are and mm-hmm. like figure out another way to sort of impact the company you know uh it happens almost every 3 quarters where I have to revisit and figure out like what is the next year going to look like and how am I going to contribute right uh, mm-hmm. and so in that sense you know I've worn many different hats uh, I've done many different things Uh, and i've had many different roles over the last 6 and a half years and i quite look mm-hmm. forward to that uh, right i really look forward to reinventing myself every uh, two or three quarters and doing things differently uh, right. which can sort of enable business impact right so that's mm-hmm. really how i look at uh, my career as such so i always look at mm-hmm. how can i uh, help the company then how can i help my team and then mm-hmm. i i am automatically by virtue of just that extension i mean i i what i need to do is clear to me right so so that's mm-hmm. really how i look at it um yeah sorry i i lost the first half of your question so i mean primarily it was with regards to how important innovation and growth is yeah. from bimo's perspective and how uh, basically the second part of the question was how do you see yourself contributing yeah. do it see growth and innovation is what kind of keeps you going right i mean if you were at the same place doing the same thing all the while whether you're a person or an institution mm-hmm. uh, you tend to build entropy right and right. Uh, you tend to decay um, and we've seen this right i mean whether it's jobs or relationships or whatever else 
we've seen that you know when there is no growth in these aspects when you're not moving ahead when you're not mm-hmm. learning and growing you tend to sort of decay and that's something to warn against right i mean so institutions um should always have that culture of okay experimentation iteration learning and growth uh, I, and that's something that i'm i'm very proud to um uh, experience here at wymo right i mean it's it's mm-hmm. still the day zero mindset um you know i joined wymo when we were about 50 people in a mm-hmm. single floor uh, where mm-hmm. today about 500 plus people across three different continents uh, and mm-hmm. we still have that day zero mindset Um, right. which is precious really and if there's right. something that i would love to protect uh, forever mm-hmm. and ever and it's that it's to protect that day zero mindset right that mm-hmm. um, you know looking at things with fresh eyes first principles kind of executing failing learning and growing mm-hmm. so yeah that is very important i would say so i mean keeping in mind the various roles uh, that you've had with vimo and i'm sure you might have come across a lot of uh, some conventional marketing strategies and some unconventional so what are some of the unconventional marketing strategies that have worked for wymo and what is that that made them so effective could you just uh, tell us a bit about that see uh, like i can think of more than uh, a few right i mean but let me mm-hmm. just talk about one so we started building out a customer marketing function very early in our uh, in our uh, uh, progression right i mean in our mm-hmm. state basically we started mm-hmm. building out a customer marketing function right after covid uh, and the idea was that you know hey if our net retention net revenue retention is you know really gold class how mm-hmm. can we sort of improve it further right i mean if we're working with large enterprises there's surely a lot of value on the table uh, right and it's going to be a long long association uh, some of our oldest customers have been around with us for 6 7 years now right mm-hmm. and uh, obviously our relationship has grown we're impacting a lot more today than we were 6 7 years back right. how can we focus beyond just like you know handing over a lead turning it into an opportunity and then closing mm-hmm. the deal to mm-hmm. beyond that right to beyond um, uh, to actively uh, sort of growing that opportunity right so so mm-hmm. which is why we built this customer marketing function in 2020 and we started by doing very tactical things uh, we ran user campaigns um uh we did case studies um and so on and so forth and today i mean the way it is structured we have uh, a template to figure out uh who do we need to work with how can we drive value across the org uh, and so on right and we're completely aligned with our customer success and account teams on this now that again if you asked me you know even 4 years back i would mm-hmm. say i mean it's a, it's a little early for us uh, to have done but uh, yeah i mean that that has been a revelation for us right i mean something unconventional right. that we chose to do mm-hmm. like a customer marketing function very early in our journey that mm-hmm. has paid a lot of dividends aside from that you know i mean we've done crazy things like you know uh deliver champagne bottles to uh <laughs> uh prospects when we knew what hotel they were staying at um uh, putting up uh, you know putting up uh, wymo stalls at uh, off sites uh so on and so forth i mean mm-hmm. yeah we, in fact i think uh, what was it last year or the year before that we took out a full page ad in the uh, economic times right mm-hmm. uh, when pretty much all of the world was about doom and gloom right so right. um and again i mean this did not have a you know uh, buy one get one free sort of a straight uh, you know sales message as such right i mean mm-hmm. it just had uh a very distinct sophisticated message right mm-hmm. saying that the best of the best use wymo what are you waiting for that's about it right okay. um so so we've done these unconventional things and that's because you know we always value first principles so mm-hmm. yeah okay now since we're approaching the end of our podcast i just have a couple of personal questions from you based on your past experiences sure. uh, so could you discuss the inspiration behind the creation of wolf lab and musically based on your prior experiences and furthermore if you could elaborate on your approach to designing products that evoke excitement and wonder while addressing the diverse needs of the users uh well i mean you're taking me back in time now uh, <laughs> right so uh, i started wolf in 2011 2012 right and mm-hmm. it was uh, very incidental i mean i didn't have any grand design or a plan as such right i mean right. i was an accidental entrepreneur and mm-hmm. uh, believe me and 
the ecosystem was very very different we were all very naive in 2011 2012 i should say right uh, right and uh, uh, you know i had just uh, finished a stint at a, a startup uh, mm-hmm. and i was just picking up odd jobs um, mm-hmm. trying to do some consulting with a few companies and that consulting practice pretty much turned into a company at some point and we started mm-hmm. uh, you know providing services marketing services for small and medium businesses um and then we started uh, building products right i mean so we mm-hmm. built it to building uh, tech products and yeah i mean and then musically was one of those products right and oh that's great yeah, <laughs> yeah. when a user so, of musically i mean just browsing perspective but yeah <laughs> right so musically was uh, interesting i mean i i was a musician at that point mm-hmm. i was fairly serious in fact i mean i would say up until maybe like 23 or 24 i was right. still confused which path to pursue uh right. and uh, you know i mean hopefully someday i'll i'll get back to music but mm-hmm. uh, it was just from my experience of you know looking at musicians around me and then figuring out how can i add value to their lives right i mean how can i increase right. their earning potential now these are some of the most talented hard working people in the world uh you know but uh, there aren't as many opportunities and avenues for them mm-hmm. so musically was to figure out you know how can we take these folks connect them with opportunities to teach their craft right uh, mm-hmm. so it was going to be a peer rated uh, musician community uh, and uh, yeah it, it was a fun experience uh, I, unfortunately i mean it had some teething problems and we could not really take it to full potential but uh, mm-hmm. yeah i i really uh, loved working with my co-founder shrireka um, mm-hmm. at that time uh, she had the vision actually i mean she had the complete vision for musically mm-hmm. and so on and so forth and mm-hmm. maybe yeah i mean i would have done some things differently but uh, yeah that would have been a fun experience to kind of go all in at that time yeah right i mean being a user of musically because uh, i've been i've been a musician myself i used to play tabla in schools and awesome. uh, i used i used to play the side drum so basically all percussion instrument i use so i used to quite often browse musically so i mean uh, even though i mean things did not work out but i mean kudos to musically and to you and your co-founder now the last question now considering your vast experience from music to sales and now to marketing so now this was primarily has been a big transition from a world of numbers and persuasion right so what sparked your transition to the creative realm of marketing and storytelling and how does your experience being a sales person and coming from the sales background help you leverage and make that role even better so uh you know i've always been interested in writing and music forever uh, right i wouldn't mm-hmm. call myself a writer or a musician but i think i'm fairly good at it uh, right. and it's one of those intrinsic skills that i had forever i mean since when i was in school mm-hmm. and uh, sales i think if you if you look at what sales is right i mean it's it's about being compelling about a certain point of view right now that point right. of view could be about a product or a solution or it could be about an ideology or it could mm-hmm. be about a recommendation uh right or, or just a point of view that's it um and so it it was it was kind of like very seamless uh, in terms of um uh, uh, you know bringing those skills that i had which were intrinsic to sales right mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. i was fairly good at uh, people skills i mean uh, i loved listening to people i love solving the problems mm-hmm. um uh, or trying to at least right uh, and uh, so i mean it was a natural extension i would say although i mean i should say that you know when i first joined a sales job i mean it was um, it was not because i wanted a sales job right i mean mm-hmm. again very very accidental uh, i graduated in 2008 um, mm-hmm. you know this was the time of the financial crisis there were hardly any jobs around i spent very right. little time in the refinery about 3 or 4 months and i decided mm-hmm. that you know this uh, pulling levers and pushing switches is not my business not in 40 right. degree heat at least Right? right and right. Uh, came back to bangalore and found the first job that i could uh, mm-hmm. it it so happened to be a, a sales job and i'm really thankful for that experience you know because that kind of set things uh, in motion that has kind of led led me to where i am today talking to you <laughs> that's great i mean uh, i mean thank you roshan this has been you know a wonderful interaction and i'm sure our viewers and listeners would learn a lot from your sales and marketing experience because being a person who is doing i mean the best of both being in business development sphere i mean this is i mean very very informative and crucial for everyone to understand that 
how you can use your past experience to better your you know future experience now being a lawyer i'm now doing business development so this is a very impo- very innovative aspect for me also so i'm also exploring things out there so every every experience count every step is important and every uh, route that you're taking is shaping you to be the person that you're going to be in the future Absolutely. and or you are currently so yeah. i mean thank you uh, thank you roshan thank you for joining and being a wonderful uh, uh, wonderful you know up uh, podcast guest yeah. thanks so much uh, dhruv this was fun uh, i really like the questions a lot of thought has gone into it uh, and yeah all the best with everything that you have coming up thank you thank you roshan same to you i mean i, I hope by more scales infinite times and becomes the world's biggest marketing company thank you so much thank you so much that's very kind thank you thank you